In the book of Exodus is a book of intervention, reconciliation, and redemption. I invite you to the second chapter of the book of Exodus. You know, the Pharaoh quizzed these ladies because of their disobedience. And they said, they had a sense of humor. And they said, well, those baby boys are born so fast we can't get there. Patriarchs and prophets were told that Satan was the driving force that drove the Pharaoh to make this command that all these babies, baby boys were to be killed. Because Satan knew, she says the patriarchs and prophets, he knew that among the Israelites, God was going to raise up a savior. Yes. So in chapter 2, beginning with verse 2, it says, the woman became pregnant. That's Jochebed, that's Moses' mother. She became pregnant and gave birth to a son. And when she saw that he, that he was a healthy child, she hid him for three months. Now ladies, those of you who have children, you know how hard that would be. How babies cry and make a lot of noise. Verse 3, but when she was no longer able to hide him, she took a papyrus basket for him and sealed it with a bit of pitch. And she put the child in and set it among the reeds along the edge of the Nile. Now this word basket is only used twice in the scriptures. It's used here in Exodus and it's used in Genesis 6 referencing the, um, the Noah's Ark. And so the, the Hebrews would have called the significance of this word when she put Moses into the basket. Just as God's hand of grace protected Noah, God's hand of grace protected Moses. Amen. She goes on, his sister, now that's Miriam, stationed herself at a distance to find out what would happen to him. Petrus probably brings up that Miriam, from her training from her mother, sensed that her baby brother would be that deliverer. Verse 5, then the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself by the Nile. Which is kind of odd because the Nile is really not a very clean lake, a river. And it also has crocodiles in it. So. <laughs> it says, while her attendants were walking alongside the river, and she saw the basket among the reeds, she sent one of her attendants to took it and opened it and saw a child, a boy crying. And she felt compassion for him and said, this is one of the Hebrew children. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get a nursing woman for you from the Hebrews, so that she may nurse the child for you? And the Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Yes, do so. And the young girl went and got Jochebed. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child and nurse him for me, and I will pay you wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. And when the child grew older, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became a younger son. And she named him Moses, saying, Because I drew him out of the water. The parents of the prophets tells us Jesus was about Jesus. Moses was about 12 years old when he was taken back to Pharaoh. So imagine the scene. Noah, Noah. <laughs> Moses is floating in this in the in the dangers of the Nile River. In, in God's sovereignty, he protects him from the crocodiles, from starvation, and worse even from drowning. And God, nothing happens by accident, he brings the Pharaoh's daughter to that position of finding that basket because he knew she had a nurturing passion to have children. I mean, she had no children. She saw this as an answer from her gods. And when you think of this story, you mean that sometimes in, in your life things are falling apart. But remember, God is a God of providence. And He has His plan to work things out for our lives. And so the Pharaoh's daughter gave him the name Moses, drawing him out of the water, which was unique because Moses, God would use Moses to draw the children of Israel 
out of Egypt and out of Egyptian slavery. Now there's a lot of similarities or metaphors about Moses and Jesus. Both Moses and Jesus were born to be as saviors. Moses to save the people of Israel out of Egypt. Jesus to save the world. Moses lived in Egypt. And Matthew 2.15 tells us that Jesus was called out of Egypt. And Moses wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. Jesus was in the wilderness for 40 days. As Moses was growing up, he saw how brutally the Egyptians were treating his people. He was 40 years old when he sees that overseer being that Egyptian. And it just overwhelmed him. And Moses knew that God had a plan to free the, Egyptian, the Israelites from Egypt. But Moses decided that God needed help. And he intervened. He said, God, let me show you how to do this. You ever done that? So God, I need to show you how to do this. And God kills the man. Thinking that now the Israelites would think that he's the chosen one. Moses killed him. What did I say? God. Oh, yeah. Moses killed the man. God didn't kill him. Thank you. In verse 13, it says, when he went out the next day, and there were two Hebrew men fighting. So he said to the one who was in the wrong, Why are you attacking your fellow Hebrew? That was a fair question, wasn't it? Why are you beating each other up? Isn't it bad enough the Egyptians are beating you up? And their man replied, Who are you to judge over us? Are you planning to kill me like you killed the Egyptian? And then Moses was afraid, thinking, Surely what I did has become known. And so the people rejected Moses. Moses thought if he did this, they would, they would say, man, here's our deliverer. Yeah. Instead they said, who are you? And his leadership was rejected. In terms of prophet says, in slaying the Egyptian, Moses had fallen into the same error so often committed by his fathers of taking into their own hands the work that God had promised to do. Isn't that amazing? There are millions of Jews in Egyptian captivity, and God has a plan to set them free. And he was going to use Moses, but he wanted Moses to know that it would be his power. It was not God's will to deliver his people by warfare, as Moses thought, but by his own mighty power, that the glory might be ascribed to him alone. Moses was trying to steal God's glory. He didn't even realize it, but he was. And at that moment in his life, as the title of my sermon says, Moses at that moment in his life was a practicing pagan. He was trying to solve the sin problem by his power. You ever try to do that? You ever by your power try to defeat the devil? We wrestle a lot with that same paganism syndrome. Everything has, it's called a syndrome anymore, so now we call sin a syndrome. Sometimes we think about the, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus, and we say to ourselves, that's great, it's just not enough. So we, use, we try to use our best efforts to tip the scale of salvation. We live a life filled with shame and guilt. We sense a need for forgiveness, a need for salvation, but we just know we're not good enough. And we're like Moses, we try to find a solution. And sometimes that solution we try to find is behavioral modification. If I just stop doing certain things, God will love me. Isn't that right? So let me use an example that I learned as a young Adventist. We had a Pathfinder camp in Reed. It was, it was in a hot part of the conference. And there was this big, beautiful lake. Thursday and Friday, the, the Pathfinders played in that lake. 
did all the things that Pathfinders do. And in Sabbath morning, I saw some of the leaders in a very animated discussion. So I appreciate you reading that. It leads right into my illustration. So I went up to see what was going on. And the question was, it's Sabbath now. What do we do about the lake? The kids are looking at it. It's hot. And they're dressed in their uniforms. And, and so the discussion was, do we let them go in the water? And if we do let them go in the water, how deep do we let them go in? Yeah. Up to the kneecap? Or a little lower? What do we do? I remember someone told me later that, that they found a way to intentionally knock each other into the water. And they could say, well, it was the devil. The devil did that. <laughs> but we, you know, the Lord has given us the Sabbath as a blessing. But sometimes we make it a hardship. Yeah. I was talking to a couple of Karen's cousins about going bike riding, and they said, well, we can't do that on Sabbath. I said, for real? They said, yeah, we might have fun. So I asked them, is that for real? They said, yeah, they might have fun. They said, well, don't you have fun driving your car? They didn't have an answer to that. Or this one Sabbath, I was, we were at a park having a Sabbath lunch. And his mother brought her child, and parks have swing sets. And the child saw it. It's like a magnet. Jumped on it and laughed. And the mother came and grabbed the child and spanked it. You're not supposed to have fun on the Sabbath. I thought, man, somebody needs to spank that mother and say, why did you bring the child to the park on Sabbath if you didn't want him to get on the swings or her on the swings? Amen. Morris Bennett tells a story of a man who was driving in the dead of the winter. And he saw Jesus on the side of the road, so he stopped and picked him up. And Jesus said, would you like me to drive? And the man said, oh no, I got it. Jesus said, there's a lot of black ice. I can handle it. He spins out into the ditch. Jesus gets out, fixes the car, and gets it back on the road. He says, would you like me to drive? Oh, I can handle this. Hits some more black ice, spins out of control. You know, it's a, it's a helpless feeling when you're driving and you hit black ice and you spin out of control. This happens four or five times. And finally, Jesus says to him, would I get to drive? And the guy says, yeah, I need you to drive. I just can't do this myself. Amen. And it's really, that's the struggle we find with, is trying to do it ourselves. Amen. Trying to, within our own power, live a righteous life. Amen. You know, um, Ray and Bob sang that song last week, a couple weeks ago, last week, two weeks ago. Anyways, precious Lord, take my hand. That's the message that we need to be given every day to Jesus. Lord, take my hand. Because we can't do it on our own. It says, lead me on, let me stand. I am tired, I am weak, and I am worn. I don't know about you, but I am I'm exhausted with the battle of all the things that Satan tries to throw in my mind. Amen. It is, I long for the day when we no longer have this battle. Amen. It says, through the storm, through the night, lead me on, lead me on through the light. Take my hand, precious Lord, and let lead me home. That's where we want to go, don't we? <laughs> Hebrews 11, 23 says that by faith after Moses was born, he was hidden by his parents for three months because they saw that the child was beautiful. And they did not, and they didn't fear the king's attitude. And by faith, Moses, when he had grown up, <coughs> refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter and chose to suffer with the people of God rather than to enjoy short-lived pleasure. And isn't that really our decision? Are we going to settle for the short-lived pleasures of this world or choose to trust God? Amen. God is longing for us to see Jesus as our Lord. Well, there's one illustration I forgot about this Sabbath keeping, and about the importance of Sabbath. Remember, 
In Genesis 1, Genesis 2, God blessed the Sabbath, set it aside, he sanctified it. Not because he was tired, because he wanted to establish a model of the kind of relationship he wants to have with us. And I remember there was a discussion that came on, and I forget who started it, but it was the question about playing tennis on Sabbath. And I played tennis, I just didn't play on Sabbath. This lady said, are you kidding? Why don't you play on Sabbath? I said, well, I said, because I see every day as the Sabbath. Every day God is looking for ways, longing for ways for us to be very intimate with Him. Whether it's walking through nature. I know some of you don't get much out of walking through nature. I've noticed and sometimes, many times when I've gone on Sabbath walks with people, it's more of a Sabbath conquest. Go from point A to point B and see how fast you can get there. And I'm straggling along looking at the birds and looking at the flowers. And that's, what, that's what nature's about. It's not a conquest. I said, every day is a Sabbath. Whether it's in His Word, or it's through music, or through nature, or through prayer. Every day, God is wanting us to draw closer to Him. And then, on the seventh day Sabbath, there's that high Sabbath. That holy day. And so, so I can play tennis any day of the week. I don't let tennis get in, my, in the way of my walk of the Lord. It didn't satisfy her. That's what I do, do firmly believe. God wants us to walk with Him every day. He doesn't want us to be Seventh day Adventists. So before we move here, we are baptized a young Native American from Choctaw. He was a he was Choctaw Indian from Mississippi. When he got baptized, he said, I want to be a seven days Seventh-day Adventist. And that's what God wants us to be. Not just Sabbath, not from sundown to sunrise, but that every day is a Sabbath. Every day we're seeking to draw closer to Him. Because our God loves us unconditionally. And He wants us to accept that and to believe and understand to understand that Jesus' death on the cross, Jesus not only just died for us, He died the second death, so that we don't have to die the second death. <laughs> obedience is not salvation, but obedience is a is a um, response to a loving Jesus. There was a let me illustrate this one. There was a farmer driving down the road and one day and he saw this sign. Experience the thrill of flying. So the, th the farmer thought, well, my wife's birthday is tomorrow. And this would be a great gift for her. I don't know if it really would be a great gift for her or a great gift for him, but he thought that he would do something nice for her her birthday. So he went to the airport and began looking for a pilot who would fly. He found this man who had a small open cockpit plane that would give the, his wife all the thrills she could possibly handle. Now, this farmer was a practical man. And when the pilot told him what it would cost, he said, it's too much. And they began to barter. And, and the farmer finally got the pilot down to the price he wanted. And the pilot says, I'll make a deal with you. I'll fly you for your price. As long as you don't say one word. If you say one word, then you pay me the full price. So the farmer said, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll agree with that. So he and his wife got in the plane. The plane takes off. And they do all kinds of loops. The pilots are doing everything he can to get them to scream. <laughs> as the pilot's coming back toward landing, he, he calls back to the farmer and he says, I'm amazed. I'm absolutely amazed that, that neither one of you ever screamed. And the farmer said, well, young man, you almost won your bet. Because when my wife fell out of the plane, I almost screamed. <laughs> <laughs> well, that old farmer was a lot like Moses. Moses was determined that he would set the terms of delivering Israel from Egypt. 
but he would have set the terms with God. And many, many of us are like that. We are amazingly determined to have things our way. We let our pride, our stubbornness get in the way of listening to God. God wants to give us a full life. He wants us to surrender our wills to Him. But it becomes a question of who's going to win the battle? Satan or God? To whom are we going to surrender to? God wants to transform and to channel our determination into a determination to serve Jesus. To to, to a determination to spend time with Jesus every day so that we grow stronger and stronger in our faith. God is looking for a people who stubbornly refuse to turn away from Jesus. Mm. Are you that kind of person? Mm. Is that the kind of person you want to be? Because yeah. the devil keeps telling you you can't do it and you don't want to. You, you can't. Just as Moses could not deliver Israel by his power, Amen. we can't deliver ourselves from Satan. Just like we can't drive down black ice without spinning out of control, we desperately need Jesus. Amen. Mentally, we know that. There was a church in went to visit his pastor and he said, Pastor, I am tired of you talking about Jesus. That's all you ever talk about. You can talk about other things. My friends, there is nothing other than Jesus. Amen. That needs to be our focus. Every morning, every afternoon, every evening. How can I come closer to Jesus? How can I surrender to Jesus? How can I let go? How can I trust him? And realizing that Jesus does not use shame or guilt. And we may fall to the same sin time and time and time again. And we say, Lord, I'm so sorry, I blew it again. So, Lord, it's, you know, it's news to me, let's talk about it. Because God has promised to throw our sins as far as the east from the west. It's the devil that uses guilt and shame. And when he does, we need to say to him, get behind me, Satan. Trust Jesus. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, you have made the plan of salvation so simple. And we try to make it so complicated. But we try to use this behavioral modification. If we, we keep telling us, if we, if we can just change the outside, the inside will follow. And the truth is, Lord, we need to change the inside. And only you can do that. Pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Our closing hymns, number four thirty-one.